everyone. Today is Thursday, January 11th of 2018. I keep saying 2017, but I'll get there on the 18th. My name is Jennifer Madrill, and I'm here in Chicago, Illinois, and this is our Designer Dialogues series. And it's an informal designer meetup for those that are participating in our various courses that we have. Um, right now we have a class running in Canvas, um, which one of our participants on the uh, webinar, Maria, is involved in. Um, and then we also have two other professional development experiences over on Thinkific. One's a mobile learning strategies design course, and then another is called Design in the Open that focuses on your professional presence and how to um, establish yourself in a field by openly sharing with others. So kind of all different types of courses, but all with this kind of common theme of we're all designers trying to become better designers. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over and we'll have a conversation with Maria. Um, there's Maria. Maria's like brave, has her video on. I was too shy. I just recently got out of the shower, got wet hair, piles of laundry behind me. So I like being real, but I mean, there's a limit to how real I want to be. Um, so yeah, Maria was just sort of telling us about her background. So do you want to just give us a quick little, uh, a little overview of yourself? Because I think it's always intriguing for people to kind of get a sense for who's participating in our project. Absolutely. So um, I'm taking part in the Canvas course of evaluation of instructional design. And right now I'm working as an instructional designer at PharmaCyclics. So I work as a contractor, uh, which keeps my life very exciting. <laughs> Um, so this year was, this is my, well, in the past 12 months, this would be my third contract and in a lot of, in very different industries. So I've done medical equipment, I've done tech, now I'm in pharma. I don't know where I'll be next. <laughs> um, I have a master's in ed tech and a background in English and, um, journalism. That's wonderful. And so before we turn the recording on, um, Maria was telling us about um, the, the, the variety of things she gets to do from development side of the house to evaluation at times and to design. So that's, that's awesome. And actually also a good segue. <laughs> we maybe, let's, you know, I think I'll do is um, screen share and we can walk through, uh, Maria mentioned before we started, she was just starting the instructional evaluation course. So I would imagine, it's, since it's a, an open, access course. There are going to be people at various phases. Some have um, um, already completed it to some who are just starting. So let me pull it up here. I'll try to walk and chew gum here and pull up the course. Let me log in real quick and then I'll start sharing my screen. So, okay, so can you see the course right now, Maria, on my screen? Yeah, okay, perfect. So this is what I see when I go in. I think your view might be a little different. This is what I see as the designer on the course. So you may not see some of the extra little uh, menu items here off on the side. But just to give everybody, including Maria, who's um, joining new, the we're a service learning organization. And so we were founded, um, all of us that started um, Designers for Learning were um, faculty in instructional design. I was an adjunct and I was looking for experiential learning opportunities for my students. And so I was trying to find a nonprofit or somebody that we could work with. And lo and behold, we found a nonprofit who actually reached out to a colleague of mine, uh, Grace Centers of Hope. And they are an adult basic education program in Michigan that works with um, folks who are um, a, yeah, homeless and in, in many cases um, have some, some, some type of substance abuse or, and, um, and various reasons that they're homeless and the various reasons that they're with Grace Centers of Hope. But if they're there and they don't have um, their high school diploma or, um, a, or equivalent, they are part of the program. They take adult basic education courses. And so over the course of a couple um, cohorts with students, we produce some instructional materials for them, for their students who are pursuing their GED. So there was a lot of interest from instructional design students to the point that we thought we needed to rework how we were doing the courses and decided to take them to scale in a service MOOC. And so I use this term MOOC, which most people I think now are pretty familiar with, but it's massive open online course. Um, and so we worked and partnered with Canvas Network on figuring out a way how we could do a project-based course using Canvas. And it's been really successful in terms of being able to bring in more people. Um, to date, we've had about 4,500 enrollments in the course. It's a typical MOOC, so not nearly that many finish. We only have about 5% actually who actually turn into final deliverable. 
But that's kind of my long preamble to give you a sense for how we came to where we are right now. So over the course of the past couple of years, designers have produced all kinds of lesson plans for us. Um, and these lesson plans, again, are for those uh, adults who have low math and literacy skills who are pursuing um, a GED or other um, career advancement, whether that be you know, attempting to get into college or just get a better job. And so uh, we have all these resources out there. So within this evaluation course, what the folks who are enrolled are doing is taking a look at those resources, considering the context and the learners and what uh, learning goals may be, and providing feedback on existing resources. And then the cool part is then making a copy of the resource that they're compelled to, the designers compelled to look at, and figuring out a way, they make a copy of it and figure out a way that they can then make that their own. And so let's just kind of click through here. This again is our homepage for the course. So all of the resources that have been designed so far are um, here on OER Commons. And I'm not sure if everybody's aware of OER Commons, but it's this, massive repository of open educational resources that are openly licensed for people to be able to use. So as you can see here, we have about 100 resources that have been um, completed so far. So to give you an example of what these resources are, that's always a common question. People want to know what these things are that we've been developing. And so for the most part, uh, the best way I've found to describe them, they're lesson plans, assuming it's a face-to-face -face course. As, and as you'll find as you go through our course, we spend quite a bit of time talking about the adult basic education context. Unfortunately, it's a grossly underserved segment, and so you really can't count on there being much technology in the classroom. Um, there's also some issues with digital literacy skills, um, those that have lower math and, um, and, and reading skills tend to uh, also have lower digital uh, literacy skills as well. So we, are, for the most part, we're focusing on classroom contacts that would be face-to-face -face where it's a teacher with either an ind working individual to a student or more likely with a small group of students. So here's an example of a lesson that I have pulled up here from Janet Lee. She was a former adult educator and now an instructional designer. And so she was like the perfect person to participate with us. She's been a, a participant in the MOOC and also have been a, a facilitator now in our most current one, uh, most current two MOOCs. So the first part of the lesson plan just is a, really a way to describe for the somebody who may be coming on OER Commons and wondering what this lesson is all about. So it's saying that here's the learner audience. You can assume a reading level of between grade one and three. So again, these are, uh, we're targeting learners with very, fairly low um, reading skills. Um, and then the college and career readiness standards, if you're familiar with the, the K-12 common core standards, these college career readiness standards uh, fall on the back of those. So um, they're basically laying out the types of competencies and skills that uh, will be covered within this lesson. So that's the first part of the lesson is the description. And then if you scroll down, we, then we get into the guts of the, of the lesson itself. So here, um, Janet has either created or found other open educational resources uh, associated with an interview scenario. So here's an audio, um, an MP3 file, then there's also um, a handout or a worksheet that she's prepared here. And these are all linked within the document on um, OER Commons. She also then has a video scenario and then once you get into the lesson, um, she's taking the learner through a, a warm-up activity. Again, these are guided by a teacher, um, talks about a little introduction, gives a teacher an estimate of how long that should take, and then starts incorporating all of these um, materials that she's, again, either um, designed herself or found as open educational resources. And then it goes through, there's a practice application, um, some type of evaluation, and then um, a kind of a concluding application activity that takes about five minutes for the student to complete. So what's really fun about this, if, if you go through, if you're enrolled in this course, you can skim through 100 or, or almost 100 resources that have been completed and figure out one that catches your eye and one that you think you could make uh, maybe a pivot and try to cover some different territory than was originally covered by the designer. Um, it may be also that you're interested, we have our mobile learning strategies course where the focus of that course is figuring out a way to take an off the shelf application um, on a smartphone or a tablet and figuring out a way to incorporate that uh, mobile um, technology 
into the lesson. So one of the examples that comes up in the class is maybe using the recording feature on a smartphone. And so that would be something that would be pretty fun to incorporate in a lesson on interview skills. You could maybe use the recording feature to record the student during the session so they can see themselves back and hear, hear what they're saying and how many times they say um, or if they're answering the question even close to what, uh, what was asked, those types of things. So that's an example of a way you could take an existing lesson, make a copy of it, and then incorporate something that you feel would feel would, would enhance the lesson or make it applicable to a different audience. Another thing you could also consider if um, you have proficiency in another language, for example, if you speak Spanish, maybe you could, be, you could think it would be a fun opportunity for you to take the, the opportunity to take an English uh, language um, uh, resource and then translating it into a different uh, language for a different learner context, maybe even in a different country with different examples and um, whatever it might be. So there, there, it's really open in terms of what you choose to do in the project. And then once you complete your lesson, then it goes back onto this repository and the cycle continues. So whenever anybody else then joins our evaluation course, they'll see the lesson you've created here and then could take that same opportunity to port it and, um, and change it. So with that 10 minute <laughs> long description, I'll take a quick break. Um, so Maria, how, how does that, does that sound what, like what you thought you were signing up for? Yeah, it does. And I actually spent quite a lot of time going through um, the lessons that were created. Um, so that was quite intriguing. There were several that seemed really cool yeah, so how do, what do you think about that constraint? Because you said you're in, in California, you're working with a corporation where clearly they have lots of money and skilled labor to work with technology. What, what are your thoughts as far as like trying to design right. something, um, you know, trying to design something for uh, a different type of audience? Like, have you ever worked with um, adult basic education learners or, or anything like that? A bit, yeah. I've worked with... Um, second language um, learners, kind of. So um, recent immigrants who uh, um, definitely had uh, challenges in terms of um, mm. And that's really an interesting population because you may have some learners who are very skilled in their uh, first language, right? And then are just attempting to learn a new language. So it's the language skills that they're, you know, attempting to learn, not also, you know, math skills or whatever else, right? Yeah, and so we had a really quite a wide range. So there were some people who were um, highly educated uh, professionals in their home country and then they came here and maybe their degrees didn't transfer other times they did other times we had people who um only had a pretty basic education and we had people of all ages so we had people who were in 18 and spoke really well and we mm -hmm. had people who were 60 and didn't speak at all <laughs> right right, right. So it was like it was quite the gamut um, I mean, everyone was kind of in the intermediate category, but that uh -huh. intermediate definition of intermediate seemed to be blurry. Right, right. So uh, what were some of the things then, um, so you were in uh, a teaching capacity at that point? So I was actually taking a course on teaching adults. So it was, okay. it was a CELTA, it was a one month course on teaching English. And as part of that program, I was teaching adults, but I was also tutoring. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. So you have a really good um, con conception of, of, um, of the population. So within the course, um, you'll see that we have a, a section on personas. And so we worked with adult educators to help us try to get our head around some um, in crafting uh, six different types of learners. That you, and it's certainly there, like you said, <laughs> it's, it's hard to it's hard to qualify what you're going to walk into in the classroom. It's all, you know, all different types. But um, we have um, a persona, I think her name is Maria, who um, is, is English as a second language. And so what, what we have um, people that participate in our MOOC do is go through and either pick, use one of our personas or, or ha craft their own to try to think who you're designing to when you're going through the lesson and through the design process. And we found that to be really interesting to watch people. Um, it's, it's, we're finding it's a lot more effective than just hitting people up with a bunch of statistics about the learner population 
you know, like you said, saying they're between 18 and 60, and they're could, you know, the usually a mix of male and female, it's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but to really kind of get into the person's um, life experiences and try to mm-hmm. think of how you can frame your instruction around um, what the person might be motivated to, to, to do when they're either in the course or thinking about things that they might want to do afterwards. So, so, um, so what are your thoughts then? Have you, have you done much work on face-to-face courses? You said your, your background's mainly e-learning lately. Um, have you done many face-to-face? I, have, I haven't done much uh, face-to-face. Um, so with the exception of taking that program, mm-hmm. uh, I haven't done much face-to-face. I have done facilitation. Mm -hmm. Um, where I was not the designer on the course. So I received materials. Right. Um, So what are your thoughts about then, um, like using an off-the-shelf app on your phone or something like that? From your experience working with those students, how would that have worked to use like a dictionary app or something like that or a a text chat or something like that as a way to enhance communication? Maybe when they're outside the class or using like some people have been thinking of almost like field trips where you know you send the students out to a museum or whatever it might be to come back and like to have accumulated some photos using their, the smartphone device hmm. okay so you're talking about uh, using technology to help second language learners in my understanding yeah of- yeah yeah i wonder what how, how that could work um like, would it help to record them speaking and, like, hearing it well, back, I think? I, I think there's, so, I think there's, I think it can run the gamut. So, at McGill, we had a really cool program um, where they would have, a, it was called uh, English Language for Medical Communication, for Medical Professionals. Mm-hmm. So, what they would do is they would have little interactive videos Mm-hmm. And each one had a topic. For example, it would be uh, asking for clarification. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you'd be watching a nurse or a social worker or a medical administrator ask mm-hmm. for clarification. You know, maybe perhaps the client isn't clear or she doesn't quite understand what he's saying. So, and you're watching the video. And as you're watching the video, you see like a little, a little pop-up with explanations of what's happening in the video so Uh um, I think that's one example it's um, in terms I thought that was pretty effective because you can also ask questions right Uh, so you can ask the learner questions so it's very interactive they can practice and I think there's the modeling facet Right, right. And so what was that tool again? That was software that you purchased or that was that they had at the place? No, so we it was we were using Storyline to develop those modules. Okay, to develop. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. So can um how effective are you is using something like that honest like if you wanted to develop um to uh, implement that using a smartphone, is that difficult to do? Given the screen size okay, and things like that. About smartphones. Oh, and it wouldn't just have to be the one we were doing I I think maybe it would work on a tablet, but it probably wouldn't be on a smartphone. Um, Did they have a lot of technology in the in the uh, place the place you were teaching at, or, or when you were? So, in where? So I think I would say the younger the people, the more they were using technology. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. was something I really noticed, and so it seemed like. Because, so it was probably, how many learners? There's probably about 18, 20 learners in that group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the majority were in their 20s, 30s, I would say 20 to 35. Mm-hmm. And those had a dictionary and they were always looking up, like they were always using their translator. And I wow. found that the application varied. So maybe um, a learner from China would have would be using a different application than the learner from uh, Brazil. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Because so they, they kind of took that on themselves. These are apps that they kind of found on their own. They were using translation apps. Okay. Okay. Um, so in terms of... See, I don't think I've seen that in any of the, um, the ones that students have, have created so far, that idea of a translation app. 
Mm. I would imagine that would be pretty prevalent, right? Why well, there, there is so many that exist. Yeah, right, right. So, I mean, I, I don't know. So I think maybe, so one project that was really interesting that I've involved was the tutoring project and they really emphasized what they called survival English. Mm-hmm. And it was very much, um, okay, you have to go on a bus. How are you going to ask for the correct amount that you should be paying? I love that whole concept, survival oh, English. That it was is great. Fantastic. And it was like, you need to go to the library. You need to register for a library card. You're going to be asked a pretty set amount of questions. And if you think about most interactions, the questions are pretty like set. Yep. Um, you go to a coffee shop, they ask you the same questions. Uh, if there's an issue, even that, like uh, you, you messed up my order it's a set amount of questions there's like a pretty standard script so that's kind of how they worked and um you know my mom is a second language speaker she's uh, i'm russian she's russian but she'll always ask me like Maria, in this situation how would i say this phrase <laughs> yeah and I, I i can see i can see kind of an application where you know, maybe uh, phrases, chunks, scripts are tagged. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, you'd be like, okay, I'm in the medical office. I don't understand what's happening to my husband. And there could be uh, tags, medical office. So then you start, you know, asking questions of the doctor's office. I think that's wonderful. I just love that whole concept. This whole survival. I'm, I'm going to use that. I may steal it because <laughs> it's... Um... I think that's just a really great way to um, approach this is, you know, we're not talking because a lot of times when we start, start seeing lesson plans, people are thinking um, almost like the same way you teach like a, um, like a kid in, in kindergarten how to read or whatever, but it's just such a different context. And it's just like you said, these are adults who have needs of like, I need to figure out how to get to my job. I need to use that, figure out how to use public transportation in Chicago or whatever it may be. And um, that whole idea of like survival English, I just love it. I love it. I really, I really loved it too. One of the, hi Lisa. I love the drawings (laughs) at the back of your office. It's okay. (laughs) I know it's great. I, now I'm feeling bad that I didn't turn, Lisa, I was too embarrassed about my current office situation to turn my head. Sorry, Maria, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm a little curious about um, something. So one of the things I've uh, found is that there's a course that's coming up about X APIs, experience APIs. It's like a 12 week free course. Okay. Have you heard of anything anything about this? No, no. Tell me about it. No, I've not heard it. I'm going to post a link. Um, but I'm wondering if you uh, think there's any potential where I can take some materials from that course and use it. Um, can you see it? Um, I, I posted a link. I oh, don't no. see it yet. Okay. Okay, cool. So yeah, take us through it. What are we looking at? So I just found this. There's a bit of a hubbub about this course on LinkedIn. And um, the idea is that, uh, especially when we're creating um, training in corporations, it's kind of hard to measure them. Uh, And it's even harder to measure if you're talking about classroom or, uh, you know, a job aid um, like, so it's, it's a much easier to measure formal experience versus informal experience and learning experience API is, uh, a standard, a set of specifications that makes it possible to do that. So it's kind of, um, it's a new thing. I don't know if you This is so that, cool. But no, really- but I need to, I need to know this. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I've heard bits and pieces, but I, I yeah, go ahead. I, if you clearly know more about it than I do. Please go ahead. Oh, no, I really don't. I am actually was like hoping you'd know, so you would tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Lisa, does this mean anything to you? Have you been following any of this? Okay, so let's read as we're going here. Okay, so uh, uh, tracking learning experience, extending to everyday work life. Okay, I cannot tell you how important this is that I'm, I'm finding this because this is really what we're working on, thinking in forward. Obviously we have these three classes we're working on, but we're also working at Designers for Learning on kind of bigger picture things in terms of how to get our materials out to the masses. And it always comes up this whole idea that learners are very transient adult education uh, learners are very transient and how do you track their um, informal learning experiences as well as formal experiences when they move on and, and and go different places so i think that's what this is getting at right it is yeah okay so davies okay um yeah so he talks about here the lrs is analogous to the scorm database in an lms but it's not required to handle all the learning management functions. And that's so true. Um, you know, most of the, even though adult education programs may have an LMS, as we talked about at the beginning, due to technology issues and whatever, you, you know, we, you may not have your students, even if it is some type of blended or even an online type of interaction, being able to run it through an, an LMS is probably cost prohibitive in a lot of places with, from a technology standpoint and, and other things. Okay, this is awesome. Okay, so let's read about this. So how do we join this? <laughs> it's a free cohort, it looks like, right? Okay, I'm definitely signing up for this. I, I have no time in my life to start taking more classes, but this sounds really good. Yeah, so they're, it, it sounds really cool and they're very, they have like a social chat network, which is super active, which is kind of nice. And where's that? And this is down here, the, uh, yeah, if you register here, they'll send you a link. Okay. And so the course starts February 1st through yeah. the 19th. Okay. Okay. I'm, this is awesome. I thought it was cool. I'm it's sorry. I don't know if it's at all relevant to our conversation. It is totally relevant to our conversation. <laughs> it really is. Kind of threw it in in the middle of the... And that's really what we're trying to get at with all of this is, um, a, you know, trying to get our heads around... And again, we're very focused on adult literacy and adult learning issues. And this whole idea, the context is so different than what we typically think of like a K-12 structured classroom and what that cohort would look like going through. Um, and all the things you, you do in your examples, your survival English and things like that. Like, so do you think that, okay, let's go back to your example. Let's do your survival English thing. Like how would that play into what we're talking about here with this is this something then you'd be able to track their progress on something like that? If you if you were to create something that they would do your survival English type of thing, is this something that would would be able to track that progress? You think, or do we know enough about it to even comment? Hmm. Let's see. Um, I think the way it works is, for example, say you have a, a bunch of classroom courses. So, you, you know, they take those, um, sorry. Let's say you have a bunch of online courses. So if they take those, it goes into their record. But mm -hmm. then let's say they also attend um, a workshop. Mm -hmm. if, they if there's someone with a mobile phone there, they can basically, everyone can basically, I don't know, uh, either do a quiz or, know that they're present at the workshop or course. So in this way, you can start to um, tr track a lot of different types of learning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it, I wonder if it's cost prohibitive for this uh, audience. I don't know. Because it seems like it's quite a lot to implement. Mm -hmm. So now I'm kind of getting mad here with our conversation and stepping back and going, who are these people offering this course? Do you know? Do you know who Torrance Learning? I think it's it's a bunch of instructional designers. Cool. I need to meet these people. <laughs> this is awesome. No, truly, this is great. Um, I'm trying to see what else they will work. I, well, um, Lisa, have you ever heard of these folks before? Tor Torrance Learning at all? No. She knows everybody, so that's amazing. <laughs> And you found out that this is from um, Reddit. Is that where you said you were getting this? Or oh, I saw it on LinkedIn. Oh, on LinkedIn. Okay. Because I've been, you know, this year I was thinking like, what courses do I want to do? I want to take. Um, what skills do I want to focus on? Yeah, yeah. 
And that's really the, we, we talked a little bit, the class that Lisa's taking right now with us is called um, Design in the Open. And so one of the things that we're asking people to think about in the first module is what organizations or events are you interested in participating in this year, either face-to-face -face or online? So here you go. This would be perfect for that. I'm going to add this to my, um, to my roster. Plus, I've never, I've never heard, let's, let's read about who these people are. Now we're kind of really diverging. Well, I don't want to take any, about anybody's time that needs to get going. Oh, oh, so Torrance is Megan Torrance. Okay. That's where the name comes from. Okay, we need to, I need to reach out to these people and start talking to them. This is really awesome. Because I really like your idea of like, if, if, if this is project-based, if there's some way they could help us figure out how this could be implemented um, in our context, because we're always looking for ideas. Well, so they're going to have a, probably a bunch of really um, very motivated and um, because this is such a cutting edge uh, skill, mm -hmm. so I suspect that you're going to have some pretty, really interesting learners yeah. who might be looking for a project. And if there's some way to integrate what you're doing with what they're doing, maybe there could be some really neat. Yeah. Um, especially because you're doing evaluation, right? The whole yep. point of um, X API is about evaluation. It's about tracking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I, I kind of wonder, I'll leave the question. No, I think it's great. I'm so, I can't thank you enough. This has been, <laughs> this has been really, really valuable for me. This is awesome. This so is I'm so really curious about your other courses and, and Lisa, I'd love to hear. I feel like I'm kind of talking too much. Um, I'd love to know about your experiences and the other courses that you have. Uh, there's the open, there's the mobile. I'm super curious about them both. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Lisa, have you had enough time to spend any time in our course to, to comment on the open one yet? It's good. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are people of age who must be lurkers. Yeah. And I remember back my tech talk days being called out for being a lurker, how terrible it, it was. But um, I got over Jeff doing that to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just for some context, Lisa and I have been floating around the interwebs together for probably what now, 13, 14 years yeah, or so. Something yeah. like that. And so we, we originally were um, introduced on a platform called EdTech Talk, and I did webcasts at the time on, I think it was called, um, what was it, EdTech Weekly? So it was a yeah. roundup of news and resources related to, like, at that time, Web 2.0. Remember when that was, like, a oh, thing? Yeah, that was a big thing. <laughs> and so um, to answer your question, Maria, um, what we're trying to get at, honestly, is the same type of things we did back in the day on EdTech Talk. This whole idea that it's... Um, kind of like what we're talking about is this Torrance learning thing where you get an online cohort where it's just a group of really um, interesting, motivated people who come around and chew on an idea. And so the way we did it at that point, they were webcasts around different topics. So maybe a K-12 focus or even, even like kindergartners. <laughs> I think some of them were like really, you know, young kids all the way up through people who are working with high school students all the way through college. And so kind of special interests around the, the field of education and technology. And so that's really what we're trying to get at in the design in the open is take advantage of what we have at our disposal on the internet to be able to find people and cool resources and, and not only just resources, but ways to show who you are by the way you participate. Um, and that's what, for me, I, I, that's how I've met most of the people that I interact with now in my career is like, I found them on the internet. I reached out and I talked to them and now we're working on something together. And, um, so anyway, that at least, I don't know if you've had a chance to, 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 to dig too much into the course, but, um, and it's also that it's also, I had a hard time when I was designing this course is putting language to the stuff we do. Cause it's just being a human and interacting online. So it's kind of hard then to to break it down and outline it and think about like what that means. Um, so I hope I didn't strip out all the, the fun of, of the serendipity of, of being online. Like I, you and I are used to Lisa by kind of making people do challenges. But, but, and then just to also answer that piece of your question, Maria. Um, so you, there are videos I've interviewed uh, 
uh, four different people about various topics associated with the book, um, Austin Kleon's book, Show Your Work. Mm -hmm. so I've asked them to give me their perspective on a couple different themes that appear in each book. So there's 10 themes. So I asked each person to, to grab onto a couple that really resonated with them and talk about it. And then at the conclusion of each module, there's short little challenges to go out and ch again, like challenge yourself to sign up for an event that you wouldn't have normally done or sign, challenge yourself to go through your contact list and pull out three, or, three to five names of people you always meant to, to reach out to and talk to and you know, make this your, your excuse to go do it. I love that. One of the things I set a goal to do is to meet and socialize with more people in the field. And um, it's so hard to do. It is hard. It is hard. It, it, but, and I think that's what's cool. Like you found the LinkedIn group and it sounds like this group. What's cool is when you find a group that it's everybody is there to learn, it kind of yeah. takes away that barrier of fear of being the newbie or the person who doesn't know everything, you know? Right. So anything, um, anything else, Lisa, that you wanted to, well, I guess maybe I'd ask you a question, Lisa, as far as like, why do you, why do you design in the open? <laughs> why? Well, I think it's just who I am. Um, there's this whole culture, for example, to tell you a story, and of course, we know all about stories. Um, the story is in Second Life, everybody says in their profile, there's a separation, so what stays is like Las Vegas. What stays, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Well, I'm right. not though, I am the total opposite. <laughs> I am one person and I am exactly the same in world, out of world, in Las Vegas, in Germany, anywhere <laughs> I am, I'm the same person. You know, I, I like coffee, I like chocolate, and it doesn't matter where I am. That's who I am. And so design in the open is just basically opening up and doing it, you know, showing people what you do and well, that's what I do. And so I do think there is, it's cool, like you said, um, when you're yourself, your authentic self. So, and again, I don't want to hold anybody up if anybody needs to leave, because this just becomes like a little post-show chit-chat <laughs> at some point. But um, when I, my, my niece is actually taking our course, the Design in the Open course. She's not an instructional designer. And so we've had a lot of talk conversations about how much of yourself do you show, not just from like, um, people might not be interested, but like almost like a security. Because we, we're kind of realizing now that the world is a little creepier maybe than <laughs> we've realized at times. Um, so how, does that bother you at all, Lisa, as far like how do you censor yourself in terms of like say I'm okay on Thursday at four o'clock I'm gonna be standing on this street corner like do you get that specific uh, when you when you lay out your things that you're doing? It depends on who I'm with. Um, physically probably not because they're big Nikolai around and we want to be very careful with children, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, even just like five seconds ago, maybe it was five minutes, I found a picture of him on Facebook, and so I shared it to his grandmother, and I said, do you see anyone you know in that picture? I knew instantly, you know, that she would know who it was. I didn't even say what color he was wearing, mm -hmm. you know, but so we are protective, you know, of that. Yeah, yeah. It is, and you know, and I don't want me to be too negative about it. But if anybody who's followed um, Alec Koros's um, oh, issues, yeah. he's having. Um, he was very. He, uh, I can put a link if I can. Again, I have sometimes a hard time walking and chewing gum, but um, he was a very early adopter of te um, interactive technologies online way back. What is he back. the reason we're all on Twitter? Exactly. Exactly. It was certainly one of the first Twitter adopters. And so his kids were being born about the same time that all this was happening. Mm -hmm. And so he was very open about showing pictures of his family, which was a gold mine for scammers because they now have uh, photos of, um, and mainly of him that his wife has taken. So it's easy for them to craft this image of this poor widowed man now with four children <laughs> because it's usually him with his kids. And so they're taking his persona and just morphing it into all of these um, romance scams. Yeah. And so it has fundamentally changed his life. And he has, like he does everything, he's been very open about how he's addressing it. 
he'll get women who call and they're in love with him, but they're obviously not in love with him. It's this persona that's been created online. And so I just think it's, again, I don't want to dwell on the negative because there is so much positive and that's the whole purpose of our course. But I do think it's an important conversation to have is like, how do we, um, how do we go through this, the, the minefields that are also there um, as well. But I think I just really appreciate the way he does it, where he, he uses his experiences of being challenged in the open. <laughs> he uses that also in a positive way to just kind of yes. call it out and have people recognize that it's an, a potential issue. Mm. Yes, it does. It's very, it's very interesting because, you know, for many years now, I've been really wanting to blog. And I think I've held back largely because it feels very vulnerable yeah um and so there's you know clearly i'm like more on the cautious side of things um because like you know the thing there's something i'm willing to share with friends but i feel very weird about sharing um my thoughts to such a completely in the open so um at the same time i feel like i should be blogging (laughs) (laughs) and that's in our course too that's one of the things like it's you know blogging is dead long live blogging i think is the title Mm -hmm. that i put on it Um, that sounds about right yep and so actually last night i was up until two in the morning because my blog from 2006 um some malware was placed somehow somebody got onto my site and put malware on it and i was kicked off my hosting site so again i hate to be the bear bummer news today but you I mean, never I know i mean that happened to vicky she had some kind of hacker from the other side of the world i have no idea where it was she had to have a computer expert guy come in and, and deal with it yeah yes yeah. so i yeah. finally got my uh, my website back up but I, I i was sitting there last night going oh wow it's like a huge chunk of my life i started blogging when i started um my master's program blogged all through school and to your point, Maria, um, I would have professors as well as students say, why are you doing this? Because someday an employer is going to read your thoughts on group projects, which I hate. I hate group projects. I to this day, I hate group projects. But, you know, like, and that's kind of a mild example. But, you know, you're, you're, you're putting yourself out there making a position on taking positions on various things. And will that ever come up to, to bite you? So at the time, again, I was very naive. It was very new. And I was putting a lot of, not, not like weird stuff, but like a lot of my feelings about education and in learning and instruction. And, um, and so last night I came to this, I, I, I got to get it back. I, I was, I was just like, I've got to somehow get my blog back because that's so much of my identity. And plus I talk about it in the, in our design in the open course is like here, I'm sending myself out there as an example of a person who's been you know, blogging and doing webcasts and things. And then now I would have let my blog go, go away. But um, so I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for them. I, and that's really interesting too, uh, Maria, we have a, um, in the design in the Oakland course, a woman, uh, Christy Tucker, I don't know if you've run into her on yes. LinkedIn. So she's, she was our, um, our interview. And then Kristen Anthony, you probably maybe have run into as well. She's a pretty prominent instructional design blogger and um, sure, podcaster. And um, so Christy and I talked about on the, on the interview we did blogging. And so you might find that interesting. She um, talks about, she's very methodical about it. And so when she has a topic that she's maybe posted a short blurb on LinkedIn or in Reddit, she'll put that off to the side on a Google Doc, I believe she said, and she'll come back to it then. And then she'll have a more intense reflection on it within her blog. Um, and she's very intentional about what she, how she maintains her blog. And I, I did not do that. And that's probably why I'm not as good at keeping it up. I would do more ad hoc types of things. But yeah. That's so interesting that you mentioned her because as soon as we ta- start talking about blogging, I thought of Christy Tucker, who's kind of like my role model, and I'd be like, yeah. oh, I want to be the Christy Tucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So she and I met. Hilarious. Yeah, she and I met. Well, met, and I'm using an air quotes that you can't see. Um, in 2005, okay. we just started following each other's blogs, and so I followed her work all the time, and she's kind of been paying attention to what we're doing. And so this was a, it was a cool sit down. We just had like a half hour conversation that's posted up on the in the course. So, mm-hmm. all right. Well, I don't want to keep anybody, but I also don't want to sh- not cover something somebody wants to talk about. Is there anything else anybody wants to chit chat about? So you do this every Thursday? 
Um, not every, th- uh, um, mm-hmm. once a month on the, mm-hmm. what is this? Are we on the second Thursday of the month? Is that what this is? Yeah. Second Thursday of the month. It's just a little open house. We have three courses going right now. And so sometimes we'll have like today, we just had two, <laughs> two or three of us, but sometimes it'll be like a group of 10. It just depends. Yeah. Very few people. I was like, wow, where's everybody? I know. You never know. It's like, uh. Maybe we should do it more frequently. That's probably the problem. People kind of, it drifts off your calendar when it's once a month, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm feeling like a VIP. Yeah, there you go. There you <laughs> go. I'm, I don't care if it's two or it's 10 or 20 or 100. It's like, I'm just using the latest technology, Zoom. Yeah. I'm telling. Yeah. yeah, do you, have you used Zoom before, Lisa? Constantly. It's great, isn't it? It is. I haven't it's- used Zoom. It's very reasonable. Um, it, I pay free. for, well, it's free if you do, yep, it's free. Yeah. And then, um, because we were doing in the early days of our MOOCs when we'd have larger groups. Um, right, you have to pay for some of Yeah, but I think it's only like $99 for the it's, entire year. It's a, yeah, it's very reasonable. Very That's reasonable. Awesome. It is really good. It's very reliable. We, we've done, we did a 12-hour webcast-a-thon last year using oh, wow. it was rock solid it was excellent and it's cloud recording so it was great we were handing off speakers and everything was still being recorded it was great i'm writing that one down yeah thank you so much for doing this it gets really nice uh it creates such a nice sense of community and yeah we also have a a getter channel too in the class let me share it this is the getter channel from um the the design in the open course i'll put the link in the chat room too you're more than welcome to join it it's if you have mm-hmm. a twitter handle you can just start talking it's just like slack i'm sure you've used slack before probably right uh i'm going to yeah yeah i think a lot of people at work or their works or the work places yeah. kind of migrating to that um, and the reason i picked getter is it's a little bit easier to do open enrollments right i don't have to deal with like invitations and stuff like that so I will put that in the text chat. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.